Hello EFB squad and welcome back to Euro Roundup. It's Sam yes. and me and we are taking a look at the best of the European action from this weekend. And we start off in our winners with Erling Braut Haaland. This comes from at Cypress at 10. Sam, what went on with him? Well, it just seems like the guy, well, I'd say the teenage boy, can't stop scoring. He's literally scored five goals now in his first two games. The only player to ever do that in the history of Bundesliga. And his first goal, it was a tidy finish. It showed that he's, he's really hungry. But his second goal, I don't know where he got his pace from, but there was a point where he, start, he was like jogging and the keeper just literally stopped. And then the angle that he was at, it was, like, it was an unbelievable angle and he just slowed it in and it shows that he's like so com confident right now. Yeah. So that's taken him to a remarkable 33 goals in 24 games this season. Obviously, Brilliant. we can already tell he's going to be a huge asset for Dortmund. They've won now 5-1 against Cologne and I believe he's, goal, he's, goal, he's averaged a goal every 46 minutes this season and one every 12 minutes for Dortmund. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. And to put that into context, <laughs> the Europe, Europe's top, in Europe's top five leagues, the top goal scorer is Ciro Mobley, and yeah. he's averaging a goal every 68 minutes this season. So if he carries on this form, he's definitely going to be a crazy, crazy goal scorer in, in all the leagues. It was a dominant performance by Dortmund. They had 60% possession, 14 shots to 11, with nine on target, with actually reflecting that, with 3.2 to 0 0.9 in the eight-time German champion's favour. Other goals came from Guerrero, Royce and Sancho, who now has 11 goals and 11 <laughs> assists in 17 Bundesliga games this season and became the youngest player in history to reach 24 Bundesliga goals. He's doing an absolute madness. Like, I think the way he's playing right now, I don't, the thing, I don't even want him to leave Dortmund right now. Yeah, like, yeah. He's playing so well. Like, his first assist just showed, and his goal even, like, he's so comfortable in, in the team that he's playing in and he's just comfortable in himself. Like, he's, he's doing a madness. And also, I feel like, like, Haaland's numbers are absolutely ridiculous, but I can kind of see, like, a raw player just banging in goals. Yeah, yeah. Whereas what Sancho does, he's, like, so much more mature as a player. Like, mm. in this match, one tackle, one dribble, five key passes, three shots, one goal, one assist. Like, often with young players, you see them start getting lots of shots and start scoring goals when they're quite young. You know, yeah. like, look at Martinelli now at Arsenal, or Mason Greenwood mm. and Man United. But what you don't tend to see is, like, that vision like the match intelligence yeah, to see yeah. those sorts of passes. And Sancho already has that as a teenager. Yeah, it's crazy. They've now probably got the two best teenagers in the world at Dortmund. And mm. so it's kind of unsurprising that they're flying. And to be honest, it must have been awful for, for Cologne to kind of come up against this attack. They're currently in Fresh. 14th. Mm. They've conceded four or more goals on four occasions this season already. Yeah. Now, obviously, they only returned to the Bundesliga last year. Um, having spent a couple of years down in the second tier, but no one has conceded more than their 44 league goals in 19 games. Yeah. More that's than bad. two a game. Yeah, that's bad. It's not a recipe for staying up. And even though things have picked up recently, you know, they've had four straight wins going into this fixture. They've scored 10 in that time. They're still only three points clear of the relegation playoff. And it just feels like, it just feels like they don't. They just don't have the defensive ability to stay in the division. They looked. They looked very panicky, like in, in the highlight that I yeah. saw. Like even Sancho, for example, he, when he was driving at the defenders, they looked so uncomfortable. Yeah, and I just think <sighs> Matt Hummels had a really good game defensively, six tackles and interceptions. But when you watch the highlights, you see him just constantly under no pressure, just mm. like spraying, spraying balls, balls around, and you're just like, you can't really let like that guy do that mm. like when you're up against Dortmund it just mm. seems ridiculous anyway Dortmund remain in fourth they're four points behind leaders Leipzig and they've got a couple of easier games up next against Union Berlin and Werder Bremen before playing Leverkusen Frankfurt and PSG in the space of 10 days so Haaland currently only coming off the bench but you'd hope that he's up to starting by the time they get to those games anyway a fantastic week for him a great week for Dortmund well-deserved winners so our first losers for today is Barcelona and that comes in from Tamish underscore Bahal. Patel, what happened? Uh, Kike Setien suffered his first defeat as Barcelona manager. That is what happened Isn't as it? Valencia defeated the reigning champs 2-0 at the Mestalla. Maxi Gomez had a first half penalty saved by Ter Stegen, but he did go on to break the deadlock in the 48th minute, then doubled his tally to, to secure the win late on. And it actually could have been even worse for Barca. Mm. Uh, Gabriel Paulista thought he'd made it 3-0 at one stage, um, kind of volleyed in, but then it was disallowed. And I don't know, there was a lot of confusion over why that was. Maxi Gomez, though, is kind of 
the bane of Barcelona's life. He scored five goals against them. Nobody has scored more against them since the start of the 2017-18 season. In fact, no La Liga side has netted more goals against Barcelona in that time than Valencia. Um, and it's a real come down to earth for Setien after a good start to his reign. They obviously beat Granada, they beat Ibiza, um, but this was Valencia's first home win against them since 2007. That's mad. It's, it's not the way <laughs> that you really that want to like cha change your track record, I yeah. guess. Uh, but obviously the visitors had the majority of the ball. It's what you expect under Setien, 74% of it. But hit the target just five times, while Tesh Dagen, on the other hand, was tested on six occasions. Barca had more shots with 14 to Valencia's eight, but obviously couldn't make any of them count. XG ended up 1.4 to 1.2 in favour of the home side. So perhaps a bit fortunate to win comfortably, but overall, like narrowly the better team. Like this mm. wasn't Barcelona getting unlucky, this was them being outplayed by Valencia away. Yeah, and literally, as you said earlier, Gomez was the standout performer. He managed five shots, four on target, and seven touches in the opposition box, more than any other Barcelona player. Gray was a rock at the back as well, with six tackles and interception, and four clearances, both team highs. Condogbia was also superb in centre mid, with six tackles and interceptions, two dribbles, and 52 touches and the second most in his side after Gray. As for Barca, Messi didn't score, but he's Messi in it. So he was still on job, but he just didn't manage to, to contribute to any goals. He had 11 shots. That's the most amount of shots he's taken in a Liga game without scoring in his entire career. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh I didn't God. know that until I read that. 11 that's, that's, shots? That's kind of mad. But obviously he put four on target and completed six dribbles, but just couldn't find a breakthrough. Barcelona were kind of a bit flat um, when, I, when I watched the, um, yeah, yeah. through the highlight. They, wasn't, they didn't seem their normal selves. However, Arfa had 100% pass accuracy, but failed to create a single chance before he was subbed off in the 56th minute. As for PK, he had a game to forget. He gave away a silly penalty, which, re which resulted in a yellow card early on, and was the only defender on the pitch to get dribbled past and not complete a single tackle. So. I know he's going to go home and, and, and think about that performance. <laughs> As for Real Madrid, they have overtaken Barcelona in the table. So the title race is looking like it's, it's quite tight this season. Yeah. Like, who do you think is going to, going to take it? Real Madrid, I think, maybe. Really? Maybe. Yeah, I, I think they, they look a bit stronger. But what do you guys think? Do you think Real Madrid are going to finish the season on top or do you think Barcelona are going to edge it again? Let us know in the comments below. Just before we get on to our second winner of the week, make sure that if you're not subscribed to the channel, you go and subscribe right now. Drop us a like and hit the notification bell to never miss a video. But we move on to FC Sesk's recommendation for our next winners, and it's Napoli. Yes, it's Napoli. Really good result. Juventus dropped points for the first time since the 1st of December after losing 2-1 to Napoli in Naples. This stops a five-game win streak for the tabletoppers who sit three points ahead of Chase and Inter. And just talking about Inter now, they missed an opportunity to capitalise on this loss, obviously, with a draw with Cagliari. Mm. However, Ericsson seems to actually be coming through the door now. Yeah, yeah. It has been reported from Sky Sports News that he's actually made the move over for a fee of £16.8 million and he's going to be earning up to £320,000. <sighs> Mad. What do you think? Do you think it's going to be a good... Um, um, addition to the squad? Yeah, I think so. I don't think they're that creative. I mean, but it, it depends how long that contract is because he's going to be 28 soon and that is a that is a, a lot, lot of money. money. <laughs> that yeah. is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. But I suppose the fees low. The fees low. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Back to the game anyway. Um, Napoli were worth their win. 51% possession, 15 shots and only four on target to Juve's eight with four on target also. So the goals came from Zielinski and man of the match Insigne before Ronaldo consolation goal in the 90th minute. Not a vintage game from Ronaldo this game. He only had three shots, one on target, two out of three successful dribbles, zero tackles and one interception. However, he did become only the first player since Trezeguet in 2005 to score in eight consecutive games. So all the naysayers that were saying that he's losing form, he's coming to the end, he's proving you wrong again. Was you one of them? Ah, uh, come on, man, you can't doubt CR7. He's always going to bang in. And only the real person to mention that was actually quite decent in the Juve squad is Benton Kerr, who had 90% pass accuracy, five tackles and interceptions, and got the all-important the all assist. Well, not important assist. 
the assist for, you know, Ronaldo's goal. <laughs> <laughs> the 22-year-old Uruguayan has now racked up five assists in 881 Serie A minutes so far this season. So, he's having a good season. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Napoli aren't, though. So, like, yeah. I guess this will be, like, a nice little break in that. And yeah. maybe it was because their former manager was coming back, it kind of riled them up. Because they're down in 13th at yeah, the moment. So, they needed really something. Yeah. Like, they've got two wins in 13 matches. They were on a run of six home league games without a win and four home defeats in a row. Poor. That is a state. <laughs> that is for that squad as well. And when you consider like what, what a machine they were under Sarri, I mm. mean, Gattuso has been on the on the cusp of leaving for, for quite some time, but somehow has managed to, to beat Lazio in yeah. the cup and beat Juventus in the space of like a week. And it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, Insigne was really the catalyst for it, I guess. Like you said, obviously got the match winner, registered three shots with two on target and five key passes. Jose Callejon, they couldn't handle him at all. He was fouled four times, the most on the pitch, registered an assist, three shots, three key passes. Whereas on the other hand, Sarri's attack, which is kind of what you think about you know, kind of his specialty as being, mm -hmm. I mean, in this game, like very little attack from Juventus. Only Ronaldo and Higuain got shots off at all. Poor. And like you said, eight shots total. Not good at all. Uh, Napoli now up to 10th in the league, four points off the European places. And with their next game away at 16th place, Sampdoria, they will fancy their chances of continuing this form. As for Juve, top of the league, three points ahead of Inter. Lazio also dropped points at the weekend. Um, so it could be quite tight between those three going down the stretch because Lazio are right there yeah. as well. So I don't know. I think it's actually a pretty exciting time in Serie A. Sarri will hope they can get back to winning ways in their next game against Fiorentina. So on to our next losers and it is Torino and this is sent in from Mickey Man Dan. Yeah, Mickey Man Dan. Mickey Man Dan. Yeah, he's yeah. loving it. He's loving it. Cool. Um, <laughs> not cool for Torino. No, uh, probably not. the biggest losers in Europe this weekend. They lost 7-0 at home for the first time in their history to Atalanta. Man. Goals from Josip Ilicic, Robin Gursens and Duven Zapata gave Atalanta a 3-0 lead at half time. And somehow, normally you see teams like ease off a bit in the second half. Yeah. Not so. Not so in this game from Atalanta. Ilicic completed his hat-trick. Luis Muriel got a double and it was compounded by red cards for Armando Izzo and Saska Lukic, leaving Torino with nine men by the end. Now the pick of the goals, Ilicic is second. We've actually been discussing it off camera. Slovenian forward scored straight from a free kick on the halfway line. Bang on. Sirigu was kind of not quite paying attention. Um, and he it just got packed in. Like, it, it, from, like, I don't really understand. From where the ball stopped to where Ilicic started off, he had no right to do that. And it literally went perfectly top bins. I mean, that is unnecessary. Like, when you see a goal from, like, the halfway line, it tends to just be, like, kind of down the middle, yeah, like, or it bounces yeah. in or yeah. something. Like, you know, whenever you see, like, the Chabi Alonso one, it's just, like, keepers just, like, out of position. It yeah. just knocks it in. Yeah. But top bins is, like, something quite special. Classy, classy. Um, thousands of fans, unsurprisingly, left the ground early. Clubs ultras were protesting outside the club with half an hour to go Damn. against the management of Walter Mazzari and the, the president. Of, yeah, it's not good. <laughs> uh, president Urbano Cairo, that, that's Arsenal behaviour. Um, <laughs> and some of the Torino players were in tears at the final whistle. Lorenzo Di, Sil Di Silvestri crying his little eyes out. Forward Andrea Balotti described it as his worst, the worst moment of his time at the mm. club. Mm. It, it, Horrendous. It, it, was, it was quite frankly a day to forget for the touring club. They had just 43% of possession while managing just four shots on target in the match, committing 17 fouls. I don't know why they were so angry, but they just came with the game angry. Sirigu was forced into seven saves with six inside the box compared to his opposite number, Golini, who made just four saves. Sirigu actually wasn't that bad when I was when I, when I watched That's a lot of the highlights. He he made a few saves, but he his defense didn't help him out at all. <laughs> um, at, at Atlanta, meanwhile, showed no signs of playing away, creating a massive 26 shots with 14 on target, leaving Torino lucky to get away with just conceding seven. The score mean Atalanta have now scored 57 goals this campaign, by far the most in Serie A, with Lazio next on 46 goals. And Ilicic's hat-trick was well-deserved, with the forward also completing three of his four attempted dribbles, as well as completing four key passes in the game. And I saw a stat earlier that since he's joined Atalanta in 2017, he's mm -hmm. got the most hat-tricks in Serie A. So, 
He's doing bits. Um, <laughs> this result leaves Atalanta in fifth place, level on points with Roma, while Torino's indifferent season continued as they dropped to 10th on 27 points. Not good for them, you know? So our start of the week this week is Neymar. He scored two goals in a victory over Lille on Sunday night, but the most noticeable thing of his second goal was his celebration. If you don't know, he was paying tribute to Kobe Bryant's tragic death. He passed away last night after getting in a helicopter crash. And for the world of sport, it was, it was really a hard thing to take. Obviously, he's a five-time NBA world champion. He's an MVP, he's a dad. And I think it just hurt the world of sport just because of what he'd done on the court and off of the court. Obviously, it's not an easy thing to take and play through. So for Neymar to do something so like iconic is, is a big thing for me as well. Yeah, and I mean, it felt like Neymar, Neymar had a really good game, but it was kind of nice, I guess, that he chose to make it about something mm. a little bit bigger. Like, this isn't the first time something like this has happened. Obviously, Emiliano Salah. That was only a yeah. year ago now, and um, the crash at Leicester's ground was pretty recent as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, he obviously had a really good game. Like, not going to go on too much about it, but three key passes and two dribbles. You know, like just showing that he's like one of the best playing in the sport right now. I think he's in 13 games, been involved in 18 goals this season. So yeah. tremendous from Neymar and. Uh, tremendous as well to, to really kind of encapsulate the mood of, I think, a lot of sports fans around the world. Um, so congratulations to him. He's our star of the week. So that's this week's episode of ERU. If you think we've missed any team out or have any comments on anything that we've said, get them in the comment section below. Pat, do you have anything that you want the people to watch? Uh, if you want to see a Premier League version of this show, head over to Football Daily and watch Winners and Losers. And of course, make sure that you subscribe to the podcast if you weren't subscribed to it already. More great content coming out there every Thursday. And we'll see you next time. See you later. Bye. Bye.